Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, my, it's good to have everybody back again. The coffee cups are empty and uh, we're ready to go. For those of you joining us on television, again, we always like to invite you. If you're ever headed toward Tulsa, why well, try to make it when you can come into one of our tapings for an afternoon. We, we just have a good time and uh, the hospitality is just overrunning. Again, we just want to thank all of our folks out there for your prayers especially because I'll tell you what, prayer does everything. And uh, we like to thank you for your letters. Now, I forgot to do it in the last program. When I speak of letters, this is my way of responding to the hundreds of your letters that I can't answer personally on all of them. So we do have a quarterly newsletter, and we send it out free. And if you aren't getting one and you would like to, you can just send us or call the girls and give them your name and address, and uh, you can get our newsletter. Now, rest assured, we never share our database so you don't have to worry about getting a whole mailbox full of junk and uh, all you'll get from us is the newsletter and we don't even beg for money in that so uh, I know this is one of the fears people have they don't want to get in a mailing list because you ought to see my mailbox where's Ruby Ruby where are you yeah Ruby knows oh junk mail that high and uh, it's just unbelievable. So no, we never, uh, we never share our, uh, our database with anybody. And uh, you won't be bombarded with, uh, with appeals. Now see there again, uh, during Tsunami a couple years ago, I sent a gift to a mission that was doing a lot of good work in the Tsunami area. But they've spent everything I sent them <laughs> on postage to ask for more. And see, I think that's so ridiculous, but this ministry won't do that. And uh, those of you that are already on our mailing list, you know that. So anyway, so much for that. Let's get right back in where we left off in this book of Esther. And uh, somebody reminded me during the break, and I had failed to do that, the name of God is not visible in the whole book of Esther. There's not one single reference to God. There are three or four what they call acrostics. In other words, there are some hidden things that you have to be a real deep scholar of the Hebrew to find them. But there is no visible mention of the name of God. But God's presence is so evident. There's just no doubt. Just like in the book of Ruth, how everything fell in place so that she married just exactly the man that God wanted her to marry. And the same way here, this is one of Satan's efforts to destroy the nation of Israel, but God in His providence has a young Jewish girl in place to keep it from happening. All right, <clears throat> let's go back into Esther then, chapter 1, verse 16. <clears throat> and this is book 69, for those of you out on television, and uh, we'll be finishing book 69 today, right? This is the last four programs. All right, verse 16. So Memican answered before the king and the princess, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king alone. Now watch this, guys. <laughs> Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in the provinces of the king of Hazarus. What's he driving at? Why, that she had the wherewithal to not obey the king? What man can have a woman like that, for goodness sakes? <laughs> See, that'd be awful. So that's their big worry. Look at the influence that she's having on the men of the kingdom. Verse 17, For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes. You wouldn't do that, would you, honey? <laughs> So the king commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. She still doesn't obey him. Likewise shall all the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes who have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise much contempt and wrath, that is, from the women. I'm not going to do what my husband says. Vashti didn't. Why should I? See? All right, verse 19, If it please the king, let there go a royal commander from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Medes and the Persians, and let it not be altered, that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. 
So when the king's decree which he shall make shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great, all the way from India, all the way up to the beyond the Mediterranean, all the wives shall give their husbands honor, both great and small. And the saying pleased the king and the princes. And the king did according to the word of Memekan. For he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language. Now you want to remember there were all kinds of different dialects and languages and so forth in that large a kingdom. So that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. Okay, now we're going to move on and then we're going to get more involved with Esther. After these things, when the wrath of King Azarus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done, and what was decreed against her. Then said the king's servants that ministered on him, Let there be fair young virgins sought for the king. Now you got to remember, you're dealing back here in Gentile paganism. They didn't have the morality that we practice today. And of course you're all aware, even in the Old Testament times, every king and every man of importance had his harem. And so what they're really going to do now is go throughout the whole kingdom of the Medes and Persians and conscript the younger and most beautiful girls. Well, you know, that's why I said a little at the beginning of the first program, you got the beginning here of a nationwide Miss Mede and Persia. They're going to be looking for the fairest and the most beautiful in the kingdom. All right, so they bring them to the house of the women under the custody of Hege, the king's chamberlain, who was keeper of the women, or the, the harem, and let their things for purification be given. And let the maiden who pleased the king be queen instead of Ashti. And so the thing pleased the king. Now in Shushan, in the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai. Okay, now we're getting to the heart of the whole story of Esther. Mordecai, a Jew, who was the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, who was the son of Kish, a Benjamite, in other words, from the southern kingdom. Now you got to remember that just not too many years before all this, first the ten tribes to the north were taken captive into Syria. And then about 75, 80 years later, the southern kingdom of Judah. So that by the time we get to Esther, all 12 tribes are in captivity out there in the area of the Medes and the Persians. So there, there's not a distinguishing element here at all. Uh, Mordecai was from the southern tribes, and many of these others were from the northern kingdom. All right? Verse 6. Mordecai had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity which had been carried away with Jochanai, the king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. Now this all would all include also Daniel, who was carried captive, you remember, by the Babylonians and Ezekiel, and uh, the three men in the fiery furnace. This is all part of that same period of time when the Jews are out there in the captivity of the Babylonians and later on now the Medes and the Persians. So this is how they're all out in that part of the world. They've been taken captive out of Jerusalem and the, the land of Israel out to the Middle East. <clears throat> Alright, verse 7. And so he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter. So she was not his immediate daughter. She's just merely a next of kin here. And so Esther is his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So it came to pass, verse 8, when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together. Again, you see, you can't help but realize, what are they doing? They're building a beauty contest because the whole purpose is to find the most beautiful girl in the Mede and Persian Empire to be the wife of the king. Well, he just lost out on all the fun of courting, didn't he? But they're doing all the work for him. They're bringing all the fairest maidens into Shushan, the palace. And Esther also, verse 8, was brought to the king's house to the custody of Haggai, the keeper of the women. And the maiden, Esther in particular, pleased him, and she obtained kindness, uh, kindness of him, and he speedily gave her things for purification, which such thing belonged to her, seven maidens. 
and not of the king's house, and he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. Now verse 10. Watch this closely. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred. Now, what's she talking about? She hadn't told anybody that she was Jewish. So for her, as everybody's concerned, she's just another one of the other Gentile nations. All right, so Mordecai also charged her that she should not show it or reveal it. In other words, I can just hear him. He said, Esther, don't you dare let any of these people know that you're a Jew. Now verse 11. Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. Now when every maid's turn was come to go into the king, after that she had been 12 months in preparation and making her beautiful, everything prepared, I suppose, her manners, her curtsies, this everything that would impress the king. Then verse 13, Thus came every maiden to the king. Whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women into the king's house. In the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned unto the second house of the women to the custody of Shazagar, the king's chamberlain, another eunuch, who kept the concubine. She came into the king no more, except the king delighted her, and as she were called by name. Now when the turn of Esther... The daughter of Rabbi Hale, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go into the king. Oh, just put yourself in that young girl's boots. These oriental kings could be ruthless. There wasn't much love and compassion in most of them. And had a king not been totally impressed, he could just simply give the word and they could be put to death. And so this is no simple thing to come before this oriental king of a huge Gentile empire. All right, but Esther obtained favor, the last part of verse 15, Esther obtained favor in the sight of all of them that looked upon her. And so she was taken unto the king into his house in the tenth month, which is the month Tibeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. He still doesn't know she's a Jew. Then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast, and he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Now, we don't know exactly what Mordecai's role, uh, role was, but he was of somewhat in, in the government of this, uh, of this king. And so he had access to the palace, see? And uh, so he sat in the king's gate. Now, verse 20. Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people. She still hasn't revealed that she's Jewish. As Mordecai had charged her, for Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up. All right, now we jump over to Mordecai, and here the stage is being set that Esther is going to find herself in a position to plead with the king to spare her people. All right, it begins with Mordecai, verse 21. So while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Big Thin and Teresh, of those who kept the door, were angry and sought to lay hand on or to kill the king. Verse 22. So the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified or confirmed the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when inquisition was found, made of the matter, it was found out, therefore they were both hanged on a tree, because they had conspired to kill the king. But here's the one, and it was written. Now these are all little tidbits that had they not happened, the rest wouldn't have happened. But this was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king, that these two men had conspired to kill the king, but Mordecai had been the one who had stopped the thing from taking place. All right, now we move again into the next key player here, and it's Haman. 
Now, after these things, chapter 3, verse 1, did King Hazarus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him. All right, now we've got to chase this guy down, because here again is providence. Here is the hand of God. Go back with me to Numbers, chapter 24, verse 7 because this is all part of the intricate working of God. Clear back the numbers. Now this is at the time that Israel was trying to go through Moab and Balak the king wouldn't let them. Remember that? And so he goes and hires the magician uh, Balaam. Balak hires Balaam the prophet, the magician. And Balaam comes and sees the multitude of Israel. And of course, God wouldn't let him put a curse on Israel. But instead, miracle of miracles, and Balaam brings out prophetic utterances concerning the nation of Israel. All right, here we are now then in Matthew, uh, Numbers 24, verse 7. But let's start up at verse 6. Speaking of the children of Israel, waiting there before Moab in order to go on up into the promised land. And as the valleys are they spread forth, that is the Jews, the Israelites, as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of lion aloes which the Lord has planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many water. Now this is symbolic language concerning the future of Israel coming from the lips of Balaam. And Agag and his kingdom shall be exalted. Now I didn't read that with the right emphasis. His king, that is Israel's king, shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. That is the kingdom of Israel above the kingdom of this Agag. All right, now we're going to find out who this guy is. Come on over now to chapter 24, verse 20. Got it? And when he, Balaam, the prophet, when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and he said, Amalek. Now this is remembered just after the 40 years of the wilderness experience Within 40 years of coming out of Egypt, the nation is out there on the desert trying to make their way over to the crossing of the Jordan River and go into the Promised Land. All right, so when Balaam looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations. Now, when I first read it, I read it wrong. It doesn't mean that Amalek was the best or the first in number or anything like that. He was the first nation to confront Israel with war. The Amalekites were the first tribes that tried to destroy Israel. All right, so Amalek was the first of the nations, but Balaam prophesies, his latter end shall be that he perish forever. The Amalekites are going to come to an end in God's program. All right, now we pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verse 6. 1 Samuel, now we're already up to the time of King Saul. We've gone through the period of the judges, and uh, Saul is now king of Israel. Verse 5, honey. 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verse 5. And Saul came to a city of Amalek, the same people, and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, that is a part of Israel, Go depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And verse 7, Saul smote 
the Amalekites from Havilah until you come to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag. See, there's that name again that was back in the book of Esther. And he took Agag, who was at that time the king of the Amalekites. He took him alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and oxen and the fatlings and the lamb and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse they destroyed utter. All right, now then, just to get what God's reaction to all this was, verse 10, Then came the word of the Lord to Samuel, saying, It repenteth me, I am sorry, that I have set up Saul to be king. For he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments, and grieved Samuel. All right, where did Saul fail? He should have finished the job with the Amalekites. But he didn't. Now then, when you jump all the way up to the book of Esther, here we've got the same tribal people. Haman is an Amalekite. So what's his feeling towards Israel? He hates them. He hates them. It's just part of his makeup. All right, back to Esther chapter 3. And so now the king promotes this Amalekite, Haman, who was the, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite. Remember, he was the queen of the Amalekites. And the king advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, this enemy of the Jew. For the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not. Now, <laughs> we're setting him up for trouble, aren't we? Mordecai the Jew will not bow down to this Amalekite, which he evidently knew he was. Verse 3, So then the king's servants who were in the king's gate said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? And it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them that they told Haman, to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. So now the secret is out completely so far as Mordecai is concerned. Verse 5, And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, Haman was full of wrath, and he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy, now watch it carefully, Haman is going to seek, seek to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Hazarus, even the people of Mordecai. And he wants every Jew destroyed out of the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. All right, I'm just going to skip verse 7 and come down to verse 8. And Haman said to the king, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom. Their laws are diverse or different from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it's not the king's profit to permit them. So what's he building up for? Get the king a decree to kill every Jew. All right, verse 9. Now, O Haman, remember where he's come from. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business, that is, to kill the Jews, and to bring it into the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the Jews' enemy. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee. The people also do with them as seemeth good to thee. Do you see how it's building? Oh, listen. When Satan goes after the Jew, he pulls every plug. Verse 12. Then were the king's scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was written, according to all that Haman had commanded to the king's lieutenants, and to rulers of every people of every province, according to writing the 
after their language, now I'm skipping a few words for the sake of time, in the name of King Hazus was it written, and sealed with the king's ring. Now verse 13, and the letters were sent by post. Have you ever wondered where did the name post office come from? <laughs> That's not a Western invention. It was already called that way back here. Here's the Pony Express, the original. See? All right. And uh, so they sent it by post unto all the king's province to destroy, to kill, to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for prey. In other words, take over their property. So the copy of the writing for a command begin in every province was published unto all people. The posts went out. The mailmen, see? The Pony Express riders, they went out, hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan the palace, and the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. Now, what does that mean? Oh, they lived sumptuously in the palace, but the people in the street, as they say today, were living in utter poverty. They had nothing of the comforts of life. Then Mordecai, verse 1 of chapter 4, when Mordecai perceived, understood all that was done, he rent his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter fly, cry. And came even before the king's gate, for none might enter in the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. Then drop down to verse 4, so Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told her to her, and then was the queen exceedingly grieved. So she sent, rem sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth, but he received it not. And then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why. So he went forth to Mordecai to the street of the city, which is before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay the king for the Jews to destroy them. Well, anyway, to make it down simple now then, when all this is understood, now we come back to the key verse we started with here in the book of Esther, verse 14. Now Mordecai is letting his beautiful niece, I'm going to call her Esther, let her know what is really going on. And again he says, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth? But thou art come to the kingdom for such a time. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.